Hey, Julia here. A quick announcement before we get started. Spirits is doing a live show in New York City on July 15th. We'll be in person at Caveat and live streamed online so you can see us either in person or on your computer. Tickets are available now at spiritspodcast.com slash live or you can click the link in the description. We hope to see you there. And now let's get to the episode. Welcome to Spirits Podcast, a boozy dive into mythology, legends, and folklore. Every week, we pour a drink and learn about a new story from around the world. I'm Amanda. And I'm Julia. And this is episode 290 with our fabulous guest, Sasha Stronach. Sasha, welcome to the show. Hi, lovely to be here. We are so happy to have you. I have been carrying around the arc of your book just like for the past two weeks being like, yes, it's time. We're going to read. And I'm so excited that our listeners can right now go and buy the book, which is extremely exciting. So Sasha, to kind of get us started off, can you give us a sort of brief summary or a little teaser of the book to get our audience excited to go break out their wallets and purchase it? Oh, good dear. I'm, I'm the worst at describing my own books. Um, <laughs> in a sort of fungal 1910s city, a cop must solve her own murder in order to prevent a bioterrorist attack. And it's very gay. It's about uh, <laughs> gay mushroom warlocks fighting the cops. Every word that just came out of your mouth is like, <laughs> yes, Sasha, why wouldn't anyone want to buy this book? I don't understand. So... <laughs> It's like a random word generator made a book just for Julia. It's so good. (laughs) Truly. I was like, oh, this one's about mushrooms. Oh, it's about so much more than mushrooms. Yes. Excellent. I want to start with kind of the journey of this book because I know it has been quite a journey in writing this and then self-publishing and now releasing a like I guess extended edition is a good word for it it's it's 30,000 words longer I don't know how that happened it didn't feel like (laughs) that's a whole book it's a whole extra book on top of the original book I love it so can you kind of tell us like I guess from the origins of the idea and then how we got to today yeah so I was living in Indonesia in a town about two hours south of Surabaya and I got together with a group of friends and every week we would come together and we would, everybody had written 10,000 words and then we would talk about someone's 10,000 words. And the first draft that came out of that was not very good. Uh, I was, I was a fairly young writer. It was my first attempt at a novel. Uh, and that was in 2013. Uh, and then in 2017, I picked it back up and I had rewritten the first chapter to be about mushrooms. I got really into mycology and I went, mushroom city, mushroom houses, what does this mean? And everything was trash except that chapter, which was just great. And I went, this is it. And so I rewrote the whole thing from there and I changed the protagonist. It was Wajet, was originally the protagonist of that book. And that's why uh, a lot of people love him. He's a lot of people's favorite side character. And it is, I think, because I know what he's doing at any one time when he's (laughs) off screen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. uh, And I tried to shop that around to traditional publishers for uh, about eight months. Kept getting rejected. I gave up and self-published it. And it came out in November 2019. And I had written like a, a pandemic book just before a pandemic hit. And so it won Best New Zealand Science Fiction Novel 2020 at Worldcon. And after that, it started getting a lot of press. Um, so I interviewed Tamsin Muir about Gideon the Ninth for the spinoff, which is a New Zealand magazine that I write for sometimes. And Tamsin read The Dawnhounds and then talked about it in an interview and then talked about it at a con. Damn. And lots of attention started coming to it through that. And then what happened was the night of the 2020 US election. I'm not a big drinker. <laughs> In the US, the time zones would have been different. But in New Zealand, the first half of that day happened over the evening, and then you went to bed. And you hoped and hoped. (laughs) Around midnight, it looked certain like Trump was going to win. Like there was no blue wave. We're just fucked. Mm -hmm. And I got blackout drunk for the first time in about 10 years, and I woke up with an agent. um, Because apparently... (laughs) What I do, I discovered what sort of drinker I am. I network, (laughs) which is great professionally. I don't know what it says about my personality. Well, much like a mushroom, you network. Yeah. That's very good, Julia. (laughs) But I do the same thing. I need a little bit of liquid courage sometimes to believe in myself enough to ask someone for something. Yeah. So I definitely feel that. That's incredible. What What a wild night for you, huh? Yeah. I mean, congrats to you. Maybe you helped the blue wave actually be a thing? Oh, God, I don't think so. (laughs) (laughs) 
I'm proud of America and I'm not taking that away from you. Someone needs to be. We appreciate it. There's very few things that we feel like we could be proud of. So yeah, it's very limited. But yeah, and uh, so when I'd originally self-published it, I went, well, I'm trying to sell this to Americans and it's a very New Zealand book. And this was in 2019 and there was no audience for that. So I cut a lot of the New Zealand-ness. And then in September 2019, that was when I gave up and when I'm going to self-publish it. And a week later, Gideon the Night came out and blew the doors off. And so I said to my agent, you know, I, I want to put the stuff back in. And Tamsin was like, you can't let them, you can't let them cut this shit. This matters. Wow. And I, I went back and I put in a lot of New Zealand culture and I put in a lot of Tikanga Māori that I had cut. And that, that ended up being the bulk of the 30,000 words is... <laughs> world building it felt like the thing that it needed it was a little bit thin on the ground um it was a little bit kind of plop 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 i expected when i went to america i'd have to water it down and instead it became more itself and i think that's the mark of a really good editor and a really good publisher that they wow kind of let that happen and i think it's a better book for that yeah, I mean, I would agree. Even like reading the first chapter, I'm like, this is like, this feels very New Zealand. Like, I don't know, like a ton about New Zealand culture other than like the very basics. But I'm like, this feels right. This feels yeah. great. I'm I'm digging this vibe so hard. I, I redid the words of the shanty to have um, Sweet Asbro in them. <laughs> I was going to say. <laughs> very specifically, because the editors kept getting caught on Sweet As. They kept thinking it was an error and trying to change it to Sweet As Pie. And um Sweet as pie is kind of folksy and nice, and sweet as is like like a construction worker talking to another construction worker. Yeah. It's not like a nasty thing, but it's definitely a bit more... It's less folksy old man who lives in the woods, and more guy eating a meat pie kind of sitting on a street corner. Suits a sailor, certainly. The chorus of a song is a place where you can repeat a thing over and over and over again. So it's very clearly intentional because <laughs> there was already a shanty there and I wasn't super happy with it and I, I wanted to rework it anyway and that was how I chose to do that. I mean, this is a perfect time to talk about sea shanties now because one, I'm so glad that, that that's a thing that came out of the pandemic that everyone got really into sea shanties for a hot second. Yep. But also I'm quite familiar with sea shanties now because of one, that movement and two, I love pirates a lot, but... I was like really excited to see a sea shanty and one that I didn't recognize and to know now that you like wrote that whole cloth. I, I love that. It, it's to the tune of Roll the Old Chariot. Mm -hmm. I was like a music and theater kid in high school, but I'm not a good musician. I was never good enough to make it. Music and books is hard. It often comes off really janky. And I was just like, there's a format here. There's, there's something I can, I can follow. Yeah, I was, it was also really interesting because the sea shanty thing, because the Weller Man is a New Zealand traditional, and like, I remember seeing like Weller Brothers stuff. So my mum used to work with like museums and stuff a lot, and there's a nautical museum in Wellington. Ooh. There's a whole lot of Weller Brothers stuff there. And it was just this moment of connection that I think is a Kiwi you don't often feel engaging with broader internet culture, mm -hmm. which is, is very Americanized. We do not often get to recognize ourselves. I, I was on this indigenous science fiction panel at Worldcon a couple of years ago, and I was talking with Tony Wee about, like, what is some, is there Maori science fiction that Americans will know? And it was Thor Ragnarok. That's it. That is like the definitive work of Maori science fiction that, that a US audience would be familiar with. But it really is Valkyrie steps down from her ship and it unfolds and it's the colors of the Titino Tanga flag, which is um, Maori sovereignty. It's about New Zealand. It's about um, Asgard is this place that's all pretty and beautiful, but then you smash that thing on the roof and suddenly there's this colonial war beneath it. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, that that is that felt like Taika using science fiction to absolutely spill his guts on um, a lot of very Kiwi stuff. And that was very cool. Sorry, I'm, I'm going off on a tangent here, but... No, no, this is great. I love this. This is exactly it. Yeah. yeah. Also, like, taking a probably, I guess at this point, the largest franchise in the world and being able to do that as well is, like, such a power move, and I appreciate it. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, hopefully we're going to get a lot more New Zealand science fiction in the world that people are going to recognize. I hope so. My intent is to make it a thing. Um, a, a thing that will sell because I gave a seminar on New Zealand science fiction in 2017 and I went around and asked a bunch of publishers can you sell Kiwi science fiction that has recognizable Kiwi elements and one guy he just paused and then he laughed for a full 10 seconds <laughs> and then he paused again 
I went, oh, you're, you're serious, mate. And I was like, and this was three and a half years ago. Yeah. Is that like anger just fueling the rest of your career? Because if so, that seems like it burns clean. I love that. Yeah, it's a good spite. It's a powerful spite. Yeah, yeah. But I think Gideon also like blew the doors off for a lot of us. Kiwis have this really strong cultural cringe. We think other people don't like us or our culture. And I think that is informing a lot of that. And then everybody loved Gideon, which has, Gideon has a line. Yeah, nah, yeah, mate. I'm not going down there. It's bloody chockers with ghosts. <laughs> I am amazed that got through an editor. I mean, it's a great line. It's a good, it solid line. Yeah. Does does the word chockers read to you? No, nothing. I have no idea what that means, but I get the vibe, and that's what's important. Like most good slang, the sound of it says as much as the meaning of it. Yeah. You know, like it, it gets you halfway there. Mm -hmm. Yep. I do worry I went overboard a little bit. Like, I, I worry about cartoonizing New Zealand. I've tried to pull it back and, like, negotiate that a little bit gracefully. The other thing is sort of I... So I'm, I'm Kaitahu. My iwi, my tribe, when the Scots showed up, we saw Blue Eyes and we went, we like that. We like that a lot. Which is why <laughs> I have a Scottish surname and Blue Eyes. But we are the whitest tribe. Like, I, I show up at Maori meetings and everybody goes, hey, Kaitahu's here. Just immediately, <laughs> because of how I look, I, I pushed it away for a really long time. And then in like 2014, 2015, I was at law school and I was struggling and I joined up with a group of like a Maori student study group. And there were a lot of like more melon hated Maori there who were just like, you fuck a papa Maori though, right? Like you have, you have that heritage, you have that ancestry. Like, yeah, like, for, yes, yeah, I'm, I'm formally on the tribal role. Dad's been trying to like encourage me to do this for a really long time. And they went, then you, like, what, are you, what are you talking about? You're Māori. Like, and so, you know, the last kind of five or six years, I've been on this journey to reclaim that. And that made its way into the book. Like, as I was exploring tikanga, I would run into stuff that I felt was really interesting, and I would incorporate that. And a lot of it was coming from law. When you grow up in New Zealand, particularly in the 90s, you are taught that, you know, you have the, the savage cannibal Māori and then the English come along and civilize everything. Mm -hmm. And studying the Māori, traditional Māori legal system, you realize that we were doing stuff that only now Western legal systems are looking at, particularly around mm -hmm. restorative justice. Mm -hmm. One of the big things is this acknowledgement that a crime affects the community, that what they would sometimes do is they would get the offender and they would get the victim and everybody else who had been affected by it. And they would all sit in a circle and they, everybody affected by it would just say to the offender, this is how you hurt me. And obviously there are some people who are just going to go, I, I don't give a shit. I'm, I'm happy with what I did. And then mm -hmm. other measures might need to be taken. But that proved a remarkably effective way of, of handling particularly uh, petty crime. Like, like they found people when they understood who they were hurting, when they broke into somebody's house and took their food, they would tend to do it less. And then the offender would also be allowed to speak and be allowed to say, hey, you know, I, I was starving and I went to these people for food and they turned me away. And like, from a community perspective, you're, you're trying to negotiate a way that everybody can move forward without this happening again. And yeah, so a, a lot of that more legalistic tikanga made its way into the book. I think I have had to push back a little bit about being called like a, 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 an indigenous voice. Mm -hmm. A Maori voice. I think it is Maori fantasy. You know, I, I am Maori, but it, it feels like if I get held up as the indigenous sci fi guy, as the Maori sci fi guy, I'll feel like people are giving me mana, like clout that, that I haven't earned. Mm -hmm. um, and, and mana is clout with a spiritual dimension. Um, and, and if you have attained mana wrongly, deceptively, um, then that is like a, a, a spiritual sickness that will corrupt you. Um, and, and I sometimes I feel like I am being given too much mana when I am uh, at, just on a journey. And mm -hmm. that journey has been what's been informing the book. No, I, I love that. And that, you know, requires a lot of insight, I think, when you're looking at a community that you're a part of and, you know, you are and then being like, but I'm not the pillar of the, like, I'm the, I'm not the, like, one representative that you should all be looking to. Yeah. And no colonizer and no white person has to be the white person someone knows or the colonizer someone knows or the colonizer literature's one person we talk about each decade. Like, that That just is an unequal burden. Yeah. I, I do not want to be that at all. Um, there, there is a Maori expression which translates to, if you haven't spent time in the kitchen, you shouldn't stand at the pulpit. 
and I don't feel like I've spent enough time in the kitchen. And you know everything in here. I've I've I have a bunch of Maori beta readers. I have a lot of trusted friends who have been bouncing this off. Tao Maori is very much about connectivity, and I think one reviewer, one critic of the 2019 edition pointed out that I hadn't noticed that there is a fungal connection with that about networks and about um, mm-hmm. every, everything being connected, sort of ecologically and and sociologically and interpersonally. I realized only much later. So. I had created a magic system that was built on that. And also my dad is an electrical engineer who raised me doing circuitry. And it works exactly like electricity. And I did not realize this (laughs) until the book was out. (laughs) That's amazing. That there are conductors and resistors. And at one point, there is a big arc storm. My editor, there was a scene I don't want to spoil, but there's a particular climatic scene where the editor is going, what magically is happening here? This needs to be clear. And I went, well, it's a lightning rod. There making a lightning rod and earthing it and and pulling everything into that. And that was sort of, yeah, it it was the running together of this understanding of the web of the world and just being really interested in circuits. (laughs) I have conceptualized the magic system as bioelectricity. I know that's not, it's not perfect one-to-one, but that's the way of thinking about it, that it is able to manipulate microelectric charges in organic matter in order to make that matter do things Mm -hmm. Um, in a way that's clearly magical, in a way that like you use microelectricity to stimulate neurons and help release dopamine in brains, which is very micro, and this is happening at a much more macro scale, but that was sort of the idea. I love that. And I I think that does come across like the idea that this is this does have like a natural in the world kind of comparison for the magic that you've created. I would love to kind of talk about the mythology and like religious system of the book, because I'm, I'm sure you have a lot of thoughts around that and kind of where you drew inspiration for the various like gods and uh, also myths. Yeah. One thing that I want to make clear is I'm fascinated by, the, by this idea that history is not like a set of static facts that are objectively true, mm-hmm. that history is, you know, a thing that is constructed and explored and faith and history are intertwined quite strongly, which is to say people are lying to you and not all of them know that they're lying to you. Mm. I created this mythology that also existed sociologically, that, that social forces are doing a kind of push-pull and saying, well, we this is not what we want to talk about anymore. This is not what our society values anymore. But it's still there. I wrote a short story, which I will never publish anymore because of the game Hades, which is about Zagreus. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. There is a lot of theory that Zagreus and Dionysus are the same god, mm-hmm. that there was this, this transformation because Dionysus was not the god of the wine. He was the god of the wild. Mm. and wine made men like beasts so that was the connection and as greece became you know it became more and more developed and kind of spread out and the danger of the forests became less pressing or the danger of the wild became less pressing he became this kind of jolly old fat man but even in the later greek stories about dionysus there's often an edge to him the fact that his followers ripped men to shreds with their bare hands is always there. (laughs) And so the way that gods change due to social forces, but still there is that weird core was really fascinating to me. And and I wanted to have like a pantheon on the way out and a pantheon on the way in. And I can't go too deeply into what monkey and crane, etc. are without spoiling later books. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it's obvious that horror is also a, a pretty large part of my background. Mm-hmm. You are being lied to by basically everybody. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That is a great way to describe horror. Yeah. Yeah. Your senses, the environment, people you thought you could trust. I love that. Um, one thing that is hinted at in book one, and I feel okay about talking about explicitly, is that everybody who is hearing Crane is not actually hearing Crane. Mm-hmm. Everybody who is hearing that voice is filtering it through their own neuroses through their own damage i think there is a read of crane where like you know this eldritch god is able to just reach into your head and pluck out your damage and hit you with it but i did want it to be sort of clear that's not actually what's happening Mm -hmm. that there there is a voice that is coming through and yet is coming through her damage and that's how it's reaching her and so that isn't a lie 
but it's not the truth either. There, there is an, um, I like to think if you read every time Crane speaks and you understand every character who's hearing her, you can start to puzzle out what she's actually saying. Mm-hmm. Just leaving us little puzzle pieces. That's very enigmatic. Yeah. Very good job. I love that. I, I feel very much like that very terrible horror movie, the I left you all the, cr- the all the clues detective. Oh, no. But which I can't remember. Is the snowman? Was that the name of it? Terrible. The snowman. Yeah. <laughs> Truly terrible. Snow is, snow is going to be a thing in the later books. So um, maybe maybe I will write about uh, Harry Hole will show up <laughs> and be unable to find all of the clues. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's talk a little bit more about horror stuff, but first we're going to really quickly grab a refill. Let's do it. Hey, Julia. Welcome to the mid-roll. Oh, hey, Amanda. How's it going? Pretty good. Pretty good. Just chilling. I know. It's like it's a chill day today, and I feel like it's nice to have a chill day when we have a guest episode. Mm-hmm. And also, like, I feel like I should be breaking out some cozy beverages and snacks for our conspirators in the refill. Absolutely. And of course, we got to make sure that we stock the favored bevies of our newest patrons, Bethany, Carrie, Halsey, and Angela. Thank you so very much for giving us your hard-earned human dollars. You join the ranks of the hundreds of people who make it a priority every month to support Spears, which like blows my mind and I'm so grateful for, including our supporting producer-level patrons, Alicia, Anne, Daisy, Fruity Chick, Hannah, Jack Marie, Jane, Jessica Kinzer, Jessica Stewart, Nieselkins, Lily, Little Vomit Spiders Running Around, Megan Moon, Phil Fresh, Captain Jonathan, Malachi, Cosmos, Sarah, Scott, and Zazie, and our legend-level patrons. Patrons, Ariana, Audra, Bex, Clara, Iron Havoc, Morgan, Mother of Vikings, Sarah, and BMF Scotty. Recently, Amanda Jake has been listening to Spirits episodes, the backlog on Ooh. his drive to and from work. And he's like, wow, a lot of those people that you mention as your patrons, they've been around for a while. I'm like, yeah, because we have the best patrons in the world. And it's so nice to like see the same names over and over again each week. It really, truly is. It's like having friends stop by. Exactly. You're like your favorite cousin makes it to the reunion and you're like, oh, thank goodness. That's how I feel whenever I see these familiar names. And if you would like to get the rewards that we have been cranking out for the last six odd years of making this podcast, go to patreon.com slash spirits podcast. With every month that passes, the deal gets better and better because there's more and more for you to enjoy from the past. So seriously, it's a great day to do it. Now, Amanda, I love kind of cuddling up with a nice book or watching a nice TV show on rainy days like today. What have you been enjoying on your rainy day? I have been inhaling a a new novella from one of my very favorite contemporary romance writers, Allie Hazelwood. She writes all about women in STEM, and I've recommended her books before. I love romance novels where a character's like career and friends and family and life is just as big, if not a bigger part of the plot than the sort of inconvenient appearance of love. <laughs> and that is totally how her books feel. This one is titled Under One Roof. It was published um, in February of 2022, and there will be more in the series going to be a trilogy of novellas. So it's only on my e-reader, it was like 300 pages. So it's, you know, definitely something that you can read in a shorter period of time than you're perhaps used to, but it still felt really substantial where, you know, you got to know the characters, you got to know why it is uh, that classic forced proximity, which I love, which is a scientist was given from her mentor ownership of a house that she then shows up and realizes is currently occupied by the woman's nephew, who is a lawyer who works for Big Oil, and she works for the EPA. Oh, no. So it is a great setup. I really enjoyed it. I can see myself going back to enjoy it again in the future, too. I hope it ends with him quitting his terrible job. Anyway, that sounds incredible, Amanda. I'm definitely going to check it out. And I hope that our listeners check out our live show, whether you're in New York City on July 15th, or you can participate in the live stream that's happening, or the video on demand after the fact. Check it out. It's caveat in New York City, and it is going to be incredible. Incredible. It has been so long since the three of us have been in the same room together. And I think the energy and the magic is going to be off the charts. I cannot wait. It's going to be professionally live streamed from two angles. So whether you come to New York City or you watch the live stream or the video on demand, check it out. Spiritspodcast.com slash live is where you can get those tickets. Woo! And Julia, do you know what days like this really sort of invite me to do. I don't know, Amanda. Tell me what. It's sink into a universe, sink into a story, Mm. whether that's listening to a podcast like this, reading a great book, or listening to perhaps an audio sitcom by Multitude. 
you should check out Next Stop. This is a show that Julia and I and Brandon Krugel and Eric Silver worked on, read, written, and created by Eric, directed and edited by Brandon. Julia was the assistant director and casting director, and I executive produced it. It is all about that time in your mid to late 20s when people are changing around you and you're a little bit worried that you might not catch up. If you, like us, enjoy like kind of sinking into a fun, like, classic sitcom, but you've rewatched, you know, all the basics a million times, check out Next Stop. It is like a solidly 21st century sitcom that gives the audience something to laugh about without punching down. And season one, all 10 episodes are out now. Search for Next Stop in your podcast app or go to nextstopshow.com. Julia, we are sponsored this week by our friends at Inked gaming who we truly love. And if you are planning on doing some shopping for some gaming gear to add to your collection, perhaps gifts for people, perhaps you're going on a road trip or renting a cabin or just having a little staycation at home and having a new special, you know, notebook or set of dice or, you know, accessories to do your gaming with can make things feel so special. Plus, they can customize tons of items so you can have an inside joke from your campaign or your initials or your house crest or logo immortalized on an actual gift run by an excellent small business that we love partnering with. Yeah, and as a sponsor for Spirits, Inked Gaming is gifting us a really nice perk that we're happy to offer to you, our conspirators. How does a 10% off discount sound? Because all you have to do is visit inkedgaming.com slash spirits and use the code spirits when you're ready to check out. That is 10% off by going to inkedgaming.com slash spirits and using the code spirits when you're ready to purchase your stuff. Thanks, Inked Gaming. Now, Amanda, I know you have talked to me a lot about how you truly can't fall asleep without CBD nowadays. Yeah, I've been using CBD oil to help me sleep for a few years now, and it's really become essential. I also have, you know, like muscle spasms and and back and neck problems from time to time. And I have really come to rely on CBD products to help me with that. It's genuinely something I really love. And I sought out a CBD sponsor that I would be really excited to talk to you all about because it has made such a big impact on my life. And I'm really excited to share with you our partnership with Cornbread Hemp. This is a CBD company based in Kentucky. They have a trademark on the phrase flower only, um, which is uh, what they make their products out of. That means no seeds or stems uh, are included in their products. And it's USDA certified organic. These are the sweetest people. It's a classic like friends who are really passionate about a thing and made a business out of it. And they are family owned and crowdfunded with all their products grown and made in Kentucky. Also, if you're vegan, a lot of their products are vegan friendly, including both their CBD oils and their gummies. And you can go to cornbreadhemp.com and use the promo code SPIRITS to get 25% off your order. If CBD is something new to you and you're not really sure what the deal is or like what you should try, they do a great job of walking you through the options. They also have independent labs certify all of their products and publish those reports on their website, which is a great thing to look out for no matter where you are buying your products. So check it out. Go to cornbreadhemp.com and use code SPIRITS for 25% off your order. So now, Amanda, a word from our sponsor, BetterHelp. Listen, I've been trying to remind myself that I have to prioritize myself. And what helps me all the time is talking to someone who can help me figure out what is causing stress in my life and how we can kind of counteract it and balance my life out a little bit more, especially when I'm experiencing burnout. It is totally true. And that cannot just be work related. It can be about life, about caregiving, about friendships, about just like surviving in the environment that we're in right now. And that is totally legitimate. And BetterHelp wanted us to use this ad space to remind you to prioritize yourself. That can look like a lot of things for a lot of different people. For me, one of the ways that shows up is doing therapy every dang week, whether I feel like it or not, because I know it is good for me. And I do my therapy through BetterHelp because it is convenient, it is cheap, and I was able to find a therapist really quickly, even though waiting lists around me, even here in Brooklyn and New York City, were so long, and I really wanted support right away. BetterHelp is customized online therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat sessions with your therapist, so you don't have to see anybody on camera if you don't want to. It is much more affordable than in-person therapy, and you can be matched with a therapist in under 48 hours. Hours. And our listeners get 10% off their first month at betterhelp.com slash spirits. That's better com slash spirits. And now let's get back to the show. Sasha, I, I have to ask, since you're here on the show and you already talked about drinking on the show already, what's your favorite cocktail? Yeah, I don't drink a lot of cocktails. A dark and stormy, a Moscow mule, an old fashioned like, like I, I tend to stick with the classics. Mm-hmm. There is a bar in Wellington that 
I'm struggling to find the name. Is it the Nightshade Lounge? Mm. It's the most pretentious thing I will allow myself when I'm feeling flush. <laughs> but you just go in there and you describe a vibe. Yes. And the barman will mix you a cocktail. Those are my favorite kinds of bars and be like, what's your mood today? I'm like, yeah. I'm feeling sassy. All right, here you go. <laughs> it's, and it's like they don't make, they don't use anything from uh, more recently than 1930. And so you see people in there sort of saying, well, I want to sort of, you know, wilt with. And I just, I go in there and I go, I'm feeling goblin pirate. Can you do me like a sassy goblin pirate? Yeah. I don't know whether the guy hates me or not. <laughs> I don't know. If I were them, that sounds really fun. He he does some fun things with it, with my terrible ideas. I mean, next time I'm going to say goblin pirate when they ask me how I'm feeling. So I, I dig it. <laughs> We have to compare notes on what you get at different places. Yeah, yeah. We'll be like, all right, so this place in Boston, this is what I got after saying Goblin Pirate. Let's see what mm -hmm. they do at the next one. We were talking about horror before we took our break. Is there like a horror that kind of got you into horror? Like when did you start getting into horror? And then like what stories did you really like latch on to? So the one that really hit me was when I was like, I can't remember how old I was. I would have been six or seven. My parents came home from existings and they could not stop talking about it for weeks. Neither of my parents are huge horror people, and Cronenberg was a pet. This was like the first horror movie either of them had watched in years. Mm -hmm. And if you've never seen Existence, even for Cronenberg, it's it's a lot. Mm -hmm. And so, like, I watched Existence, you know, as a teenager years and years later, but I think Cronenberg rooted in my psyche very early. I mean, I feel like a kind of a basic bitch with horror. Like, I Stephen, I, I read Stephen King a lot when I was a teenager. The last great horror book that really got me was Cass Core's Hammers on Bone. Hmm. Which is, like, that title, Hammers on Bone, I went, look, you can't, put, you can't make a title like that. It's too much. <laughs> the book cannot justify that title. And then it kind of did. <laughs> and it got under my skin. How dare. I had mixed feelings about nothing but blackened teeth, but I think Cass Core generally like, has this real talent for really nasty horror descriptions. There's a line in A Song for Quiet about someone's face melting like fat in a good skillet. Ooh. Oh, damn. Sometimes horror writers just write lines and you're like, oh, that's going to stick with me for the rest of my life. Yeah. Cool, yeah. I guess. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. The experience of having a body is so fundamentally horrifying so often yeah. that I think only horror gets bodies really right. Yeah. And oh, it's so good. <laughs> yeah. I don't know whether I'm a horror writer. I don't feel like I, I kind of, I think there would be people who had won the horror awards and stuff who would sort of shake their heads at what I do. But genre is, is weird and fluffy. Yeah. Um, I think I'm, I'm a science fiction writer who brings in horror elements more than anything else. Mm -hmm. But I, I love good horror. And it is. It, 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 particularly, the thing I wanted to bring was that em embodiedness. I think fight scenes and action in science fiction can often feel a little bit floaty. Mm -hmm. And I think if you bring it down to a, a body level, you can make really crunchy, interesting stuff that, that, that lives more in that space. Yeah. That's why particularly fungal horror really, really gets me going. Because there's something about the, I don't know, like damp that feels like my lived reality of just like having a body like shower shoes at school I, I just like I don't know the, the creeping awareness of mold has been one of the undercurrents of my adult life yep. of being like oh do I really have to clean my shower that often wow and it just there's something about it of like the unseen that is slowly gaining power yeah I mean I so New Zealand has a real problem with damp and badly constructed homes and I lived for about five years in a home that was like just ruined with black mold and it's just permanently messed up my respiratory system that was a that was a horrible house that was falling apart and it is the place where the only real horror things have happened to me but i think they influenced the writing a lot and there was a moment where so what happened was a tree root broke through the old clay drainage pipe that all of the, the gray water from the house was going through and it swelled up and it blocked it and i had an ensuite on the bottom floor and the kitchen was on the top floor and so the shower starts like filling up filling up and i'm trying to you know, plunger it and fix this. You get that moment where you're plungering, where you're like, I've done it. You feel feel the pressure. Pull the plunger up and tiny bones and black water and waterlogged skin just flooded this whole thing. And it turned out to be food waste. 
Somebody had uh, put a put a rotisserie oh, chicken no. oh, through, God. through the thing, oh, which no. had caused a problem. Things falling apart like that. That problem took probably about four years to come to fruition, and then it all happened at once. Yeah. And that can happen in bodies, too. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That house, I think, has connected that quite strongly to my my sense of embodiment and my sense of horror. That that place was like slowly eating me from the inside out, and it looked fine until suddenly, very suddenly, it didn't. That's the most gothic horror shit I've ever heard in my entire life. So Poe could never. Poe wishes. It was surreal. Do you want the funny, the funny coda to it? Yes. Yes. <laughs> um. So I was at grad school when this happened, and so I had to call a plumber. The bathroom was flooding, and I put towels down. I spent. Oh, I did not sleep. That whole night. Oh, man. And I'm piling towels and towels and towels. And the plumber gets there late at like 11 a.m. And I've, I've missed class. I've had to call, like, you know, contact my supervisor and go, I'll be late because of this thing. All right. But I rush down after the plumber gets in. And, you know, we're already done. She's like, oh, come back at, come back at one. And so I went to get lunch. And I stink of sewage. And I haven't slept. And I haven't eaten. And I, I went to a Malaysian place and I got roti chennai. And I'm sitting there eating it like with this massive enthusiasm, shoveling this this shit into my face. And I look up. This is the most New Zealand story. This is the most New Zealand thing that's ever happened to me. <laughs> sitting across from me at the next table is Jermaine Clement. <laughs> and he's just, he's got this thousand yard stare. <laughs> And I am not unconvinced that that is going to make its way into an episode of Wellington Paranormal. We'll see. Because it is the the worst I have looked in my entire life. The closest <laughs> to goblin. That, that is goblin mode. Like actual hardcore goblin mode. And Jermaine fucking Clement is just staring at me. Damn. I mean, congratulations on your inclusion into the What We Do in the Shadows universe, I guess. I think <laughs> I, I'm going to live in terror. I can't watch that show because I'm, I'm going to be in it. It's going to be awful. Sasha, if I see anything that resembles that story, I will message you and let you know. Oh, thank you. <laughs> If you can't watch it yourself, someone else has to let you know that that exists in the world now. <laughs> That's incredibly good. <laughs> so I, I feel like that story kind of embodies my next like question or like tangent that I wanted to take you on, which was when you were talking about the book on your website, you call it joyously weird. And I feel like that statement or that phrase is so evocative and fills me with such a joy and also makes me feel the way I did when I was reading the book. Mm. So like, was that kind of what you were setting out to do when you were writing the book? You're like, I want something weird, but like proud of its weirdness. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I have really mixed feelings about the term hope punk. Yeah. If hope punk is to be like a, a, a thing that is actually punk, it needs to embody the fake Emma Goldman quote, it's not my revolution if I can't dance. Mm -hmm. and, and so finding joy in dark places as a revolutionary act was something that, that was like going through me at the time. And particularly with regard to like queer community building. Mm -hmm. You find a group of people who have been told by society their entire lives that they are worth less, and they find joy in each other and their difference, and that can become revolutionary. No, it doesn't. It isn't, I think, inherently revolutionary. You can just have a bunch of friends and, and hang out in goblin mode, <laughs> but, but there is a power in it that can be leveraged, and that was what I kind of really wanted to hit. And so it, it is joy and weirdness and revolution. Amazing. Honestly, a great combo of all three. Somebody called it Discworld Elysium. I wish I wish I could remember who called it Discworld Elysium, but that's the nicest thing anyone said about it and it's stuck in my head. That's so good. I also saw someone describe it as Southeast Asian inspired. And I know that you spent a lot of time in like Malaysia and Indonesia and Singapore. Was there a moment when you were in those areas that you were like, this is something that I want to expand upon? These are like aspects that I want to include in my own world. Yeah. When I first flew into Singapore, it was at dusk 
and there were so like I'm New Zealand has not got a lot of people. New Zealand is the size of an American city. Singapore has you know some of the highest population density in the world, and I remember seeing ships in the harbor backed up across the horizon. Wow. And suddenly getting this tremendous sense of scale that, that I had never had in my life before. And like I, well, I, I've traveled a bit, um, went to Europe when I was a teenager. I've spent a bit of time in the Pacific Northwest. None of these can hold a candle to an Asian city in terms of how suddenly humanity kind of hits you, that you have to survive and stay sane in this space with so many people. And you have to become really, really aware of everyone around you. And you have to act with just, a, you, you, you have to be kind. People have to be kind and people have to be smart. And they tend to be. I think there is this portrayal of Asian cities that you see in media a lot as, you know, like chaotic and grimy. And I'm, I'm not going to say that, you know, KL is a perfect city where everything is like lovely and nice. But I think you come face to face with people a lot more. And that, I think, was the thing that made its way into the book the most. That unavoidably, if you live in a city, you must be part of that city. Well said. And sometimes, because I, I spoke to um, Nora Jemison uh, um, a couple of weeks ago, and we were talking about the city we became, and she was saying, you know, some cities reject you. Some, some cities, you, you try to live there. And they just won't have you. I feel like Singapore bounced me a little, but KL didn't. Mm. Yeah, I, I I don't know what it is about them where where that happened, but this the cityness I think was the big thing I wanted to take away because you 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 have to be very cognizant of like I am not a Southeast Asian writer, and I during rewrites one of the things I did was try and root it a lot more in New Zealand. And and when I incorporated Southeast Asian elements, I tried to incorporate elements that I like. I, I felt like I was very familiar with. I'm pretty connected with um, the readings at Sesankro from Kuala Lumpur, and uh, like I bounced off a couple of them just to make sure I was kind of getting everything right. The other shocking thing for me was the weather. New Zealand is becoming more and more tropical uh, as climate change kind of gets us, but um, it does that. I'm from the South Island, which generally is is one of the colder, grimmer parts of the country. And the weather of the tropics, I think, influenced the book a lot. It's so much more dramatic. You haven't heard thunder until you've heard monsoon thunder. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know why acoustically it's so different, but it sounds like an animal roaring. Mm -hmm. Again, it is that sense of scale that really struck me. Everything feels bigger. Even in a way that, like, you know, Seattle is, is bigger than basically anywhere in New Zealand. Seattle didn't didn't strike me with that sense of scale. I, I love it. Seattle just feels like Wellington, but bigger <laughs> a lot of the time. And I love Wellington to bits. The interconnectedness of everything bowls you the fuck down yeah. when you go and live in a big Asian city. Oh, that's, that's awesome. I, I love that description. And I can see kind of how that feeling of interconnectedness definitely made its way into the book. I feel like this is probably going to be my last question. So if there's anything that we haven't discussed yet that you wanted to touch on, let me know now. Um, so the big one, which it's not in book one as much, but it's going to be pretty big in book two, mm -hmm. was we grew up with, so my grandmother was uh, from, from Corfu mm -hmm. in, in Greece, and we grew up with a lot of Greek and Slavic uh, folklore. So her family were diplomats. My grandmother was born in the Ottoman Empire. That's something that I, I still struggle to, to understand because that feels like it's a million years ago. That's wild. They were, they were these Ottoman diplomats. Um, and so she was from Istanbul, but the family are from, from Corfu. She was from Constantinople. Wow. <laughs> but we had like a lot of Slavic folklore in the house. I distinctly remember James Mayhew's uh, Tales of Koshka the Cat. And I talked about that on Twitter recently, and James Mayhew showed up in my mentions. And I've been talking to all these like big name sci-fi writers, and recently I've gotten over like the that rabbit instinct. Like we're colleagues, we can we can have this conversation. James Mayhew locked me up like a small child, being asked to like <laughs> order at McDonald's. <laughs> like I was like five years old again. I was like, thank you, Mister. Thank you. That's very nice. But I think Russian and Turkish and and Greek 
and sort of um, like South Slavic folklore are things that are in the books. In book one, not as much, but definitely there uh, and are going to be a much more prominent part of book two because we are going to Radovan. You'll have to come back and tell us all about it. Yes, please. So my final question for you, this has been like a almost decade long kind of journey for you going from the, the first draft to now. Yeah. What is it that you're most proud of with this book? People say the book took 10 years, and I want to push back on that a little bit. I started writing the first draft 10 years ago, and it's coming out now. There were a lot of breaks. Mm -hmm. I think the book probably took about a year. Mm -hmm. Still a lot of work and time. Right. I had this moment where, you know, you you hate your own writing when you're writing it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, And so I I finished the first self-published. Like, I I had the version I was going to go shop around to agents. And I left it for a month, and I, then I printed it off in Comic Sans, which does this. <laughs> you've, you've heard that trick? It, like, rewires your brain a little bit. Yeah. yeah. And I read it, and I cried. <laughs> oh, my God. When I read this book, and it felt like someone else had written it, it hit me like a truck. And I didn't think I was capable of giving anyone that sort of... A, I didn't believe in this book. Like, even after that, I didn't believe into this book until Tams and Mule said it was good. And I was like... <laughs> Well, she she writes good books. She writes books that are clearly better than mine. So uh, she must be right. I trust her opinion more than my own. Oh, yeah. She says the book isn't trash. The book is good. But I, I did blow myself down when I when I read it like it was written by someone else. And that moment made me feel like, you know, I've, I've been trying. I've been writing. I've been working on my craft for a decade now. And that made it feel worth it. And, and that made me immensely proud of myself that's so awesome incredible i have no ownership over your success but i'm proud of you (laughs) the book is so good and i'm so excited for our listeners to go read it absolutely and that's a great place to tell people hey where can they find the book and find more of your work and you on the internet Right now, because we are recording this uh, in in the past, we are time travelers. We are talking to you from from yesterday. We are in Monday. You are in Tuesday. So Mm -hmm. that's pretty cool. (laughs) It's the New Zealand experience. We're the first place to see the sunrise. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. It's going to be in Barnes & Noble. It's going to be in all major retailers. It's currently available for pre-order at Barnes & Noble and Amazon and should be available to pick up by the time you're listening to this. Uh, You can find me on Twitter at understatesman which was a pun I made up when I was working in as a jobber in politics because <laughs> I was under statesman, but Kiwis are also very understated. <laughs> that's the terrible joke. And that's uh, also my website is um, theunderstatesman.com. Yeah, though, those are the only social media I do. I'm, I am grateful that my publisher doesn't require me to go on TikTok. <laughs> mm-hmm. I'm, I'm 30. Listen, you're, you're talking to the right people here. Don't worry about it. I don't have any beef with TikTok. I want to be clear. It's cool. I'm just not <laughs> cool enough for it. Mm-hmm. Big mood. Yeah. Big mood. I talked to some high schoolers last week and I was like about like podcasting and stuff. And I was like, oh, yeah, like blah, 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 platforms, Facebook, you know, Instagram, TikTok. I was like, you can tell that I'm turning 30 next week because of how I just said the word TikTok. And they were like, yeah, we can. We can. <laughs> Ouch. It's, hurts. it's important to acknowledge that you're not cool anymore. Exactly. I, I refuse to not be cool anymore. I'll I'll go to my grave. <laughs> being cool it's easy for me because i was never cool (laughs) like i was a theater kid listen you're talking to the same folks here yeah like queer mushroom nerd theater kids yeah unite queer mushroom goblin core theater kids this is Mm -hmm. it's all us it's us well we will have all those links and many more in the description um of this podcast episode but sasha thank you so much for starting out the day and seeing the sunrise first i'll let you know how it looks on our end uh tomorrow and um just so appreciate your time Uh, yeah and uh thank you very much for having me it's been lovely it was our pleasure thank you for delighting us with all your stories and all of your insight we really appreciate it and remember everybody stay creepy stay cool Spirits was created by Amanda McLaughlin, Julia Shafini, and Eric Schneider, with music by Kevin McLeod and visual design by Allison Wakeman. Keep up with all things creepy and cool by following us at Spirits Podcast on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and Tumblr. We also have all of our episode transcripts, guest appearances, and merch on our website, as well as a form to send us in your urban legends and your advice from folklore questions at spiritspodcast.com. 
join our member community on Patreon, patreon.com slash spirits podcast for all kinds of behind the scenes goodies. Just a dollar gets you access to audio extras with so much more like recipe cards, both alcoholic and non-alcoholic for every single episode, director's commentaries, real physical gifts, and more. We are a founding member of Multitude, an independent podcast collective and production studio. If you like spirits, you will love the other shows that live on our website at multitude.productions. Above all else, if you liked what you heard today, please text one friend about us. That's the very best way to help keep us growing. Thanks for listening to Spirits. We'll see you next week. Bye.